Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX14 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new World of Warships gameplay today on our channel. In this episode I'm sailing out in the tier 6 Japanese aircraft carrier, known as the Ryujo, in a tier 8 standard battle on the map Land of Fire. The focus of today's gameplay is how we deal with plus 2 matchmaking, as the context of this match is that I've been on a string of tier 8 games in the Ryujo and this was my final game of the night and I've been having a lot of frustration in trying to work my way around the improved anti-aircraft defences of tier 8 ships compared to the tier 6 ships that I'd normally expect to face. The likes of the enemies North Carolina, Tirpitz and New Orleans come to mind, but they've also got a considerable number of cruisers at tier 6 which we need to be wary of if they're mounting the defensive AA consumable such as the two Nuremberg's. Now to start off the game, what I'm going to do is use the preparedness of my fighters to my advantage compared to the independences, i.e. my opponent's own. Where I can get these fighters up within 11 seconds, I get them into the takeoff situation, and it means I'll be able to get my fighters towards the enemy spawn much faster than the enemy independents can towards my fighters, i.e. to intercept them, or alternatively towards my team spawn. And by providing this information to my teammates, I'm also giving myself an idea of where the enemy's main fleet will be moving, and where the majority of their ships will cluster together. Because with my strike package, I am using the Type 6 Mod 2 hull, I'm not intending to take my two squadrons of dive bombers and my two squadrons of torpedo bombers to attack the main fleet. They're not durable enough, with all the planes in the Ryujo set up having a health pool per plane of 1,271, the independents having stronger planes by comparison. But instead, I intend to pick on the enemy ships that are not being given direct AA support. I mean, they're not within the AA rings of the ships of the better AA suites. Alternatively, you've got two moderately defended AA ships being able to cover one another with AA batteries. And using our fighters, we've already detected that it looks as though the enemy team's push will be coming down the eastern side of the map. And our team are also sending their push down the eastern side. It seems to be a recurring theme of Land of Fire standard battle at the moment. So instead, I'm already moving all of my aircraft towards the western side of the map. Because if I can pick on isolated ships such as the enemy's destroyer, the tier 7 Japanese destroyer the Akatsuki, which doesn't have very good AA, and it needs to be protected by any, either the enemy aircraft carrier, or alternatively by an enemy cruiser, we're going to have a field day. Particularly our Shiratsuyu, who will then be able to move on unhindered, as they won't have a destroyer threat to go up against them. We do spot the enemy Akatsuki, and we start to move our bombers over towards it, keeping our fighters over the destroyer to keep it spotted, and therefore force it into a bit of an uncomfortable situation. And what you'll see is the enemy Akatsuki decides to go to a smokescreen. And with them going to a smoke, I'm not going to be moving my planes away from the smokescreen, just moving them north. And this is important, because I can see on the minimap our friendly grass bay is north of the Akatsuki's current position, and with the Akatsuki being broadside to them, it means they could throw their 10km torpedoes towards my ally. So I want to see those triple sets of torpedoes coming out from that smoke screen. And as the Akatsuki's not extending their smoke, I know that they're still stuck in there because they haven't left it and haven't been spotted, and I can as a result accurately cross drop them within the smoke, and hope that I at least hit with one torpedo. Perhaps even two, perhaps even three will get them out of the game. The cross drops in on the manual drops, and we'll see that we pick up two torpedo hits. Now that's 13,000 health off of that destroyer already, and they started the game on 13,100, so they're in a critical state. And very quickly we'll see they're leaving the smoke now with only 32 health, and we're going to manual drop them with our dive bombers to get them out of the game, using the accuracy of our dive bombers and advantage of the Japanese aircraft carriers. Now with that destroyer out of the way, it means our Shiratsu Yu and our Grass Bay can have a field day down the western side of the map if they want to now, and our Shiratsu Yu in particular can contest the enemy's base without fear of being spotted by a destroyer. The enemy team will really need to invest in moving cruisers forward to spot them. So our team has the greater torpedo threat. In the meantime as our bombers are starting to land to reload, I move my fighters over towards the centre east side but I'm not moving them onto the eastern section of the map. Now this is important because I've been looking at my opponent's fighter aircraft along with their bombers and what I'm noticing is they seem to be rather adamant on attacking our main fleet and trying to push their aircraft through the AA defences of a Bismarck, a Tirpitz, a Cleveland and a Lagazinier in particular. Which means they are really going up against the odds and they're going to be losing a lot of aircraft every time they proceed to do so. So I don't want to antagonise my opponent to come and have a look at me. Instead I'm just going to keep my fighters in the centre, that way provide spotting against the enemies Nelson and Leon who are caught out in a bit of an awkward position by the looks of things to our new Mexico and our Pensacola 
and on top of that, if the enemy fighters do drift this way, I've got my fighters ready to counter them. At the very least, I can lock up the enemy fighters for a given period of time, but perhaps I'll be able to win the engagement were the enemy independence's fighter squadron a little bit weaker. And continually looking at the Mima, I can see their fighter icon moving down towards the southeastern corner of the map. And what that tells me is that the independence got to be really down in the southeastern corner, and I'm not going to be able to go for a attack run on the carrier using all my bombers unless I want to try and maneuver my way all around the map, going from the west down to southwest and then along the southern side to attack them from behind. So instead of trying to strike the enemy aircraft carrier, instead I'll be focusing on these battleships. They're in a bit of a difficult position. Now in the meantime, I'm just going to be consolidating my bomber threat towards the centre of the map. I can't push in at the moment because the enemy Nuremberg's there. Now I could give it a shot, I could try and strike with everything at once and just hope that some planes make it through. But why rush when I've got the ability to see what happens to that Nuremberg because it's a squishy cruiser. And the other enemy Nuremberg seems to be somewhere in the south, we're not sure where, and the cyclone's coming in at only one and a half minutes away, which I'll give our planes a bit of a shield of comfort in terms of spotting. Oh, they won't be detected as easily until the very last moment when they're on top of the target. So for now, we're just going to bide our time. Keep our fighters relatively close to those battleships to keep them spotted for our teammates. Keep an eye on what the enemy Nuremberg is doing, either one that's near the Nelson, and as soon as we see they start drifting away, which the radial movements of their catapult fighters would indicate they are starting to drift away, they're now currently down the northeastern side of their Nelson, although Nelson seems to be pulling away from them, and the other Nuremberg is respotted in the base, moving southeastwards. What we can find is that we can now strike the Nelson with our dive bar squadrons to sight and try and set multiple fires, and therefore force them to use up their damage control party. Our torpedo bombers itching to strike as well. Now the Nelson's a bit of a tricky one, because if we don't call it right, we won't be able to knock them out in a single punch, and if we get it right, they may decide to trigger their super hill right at the last moment, which means all the damage we do won't be for nothing, but we'll have to redo it all again. So we're going in with the dive bombs and a manual drop, hopefully we'll set another fire. And there we go, we cause one fire, and do a considerable amount of damage, and we try to finish them off with their health pool heading down towards 20,000 now. We'll need approximately five to six torpedo hits to get them out of the way. We come in, and going for the swing here on the manual drops, we call one of the manual drops, the leftmost one, a little bit too close to our opponent, meaning one of the torpedoes does not arm in time. But we do hit with three torpedoes, it wasn't the best strike by all means, and they call in their super heal, and it means they start to recover all the health they've just lost. Or a good chunk of it at least. But what we can say is we have forced that Nelson into a position where they drive consumables now, which means any subsequent fires or floods caused on them for a good period of time will stick and cause considerable bleed damage, and on top of that, if we do get another strike off, they're not going to be able to super heal it away immediately. In terms of what I'm doing with my actual ship at this point, the aircraft carrier, I'm gradually moving it down the map. I'm moving it down the centre western side, and by doing this, it means that my carrier is close to the battlefield, and it means the overall effective reload time of all my aircraft is going to be shorter than keeping my carrier all the way back in grid square, for example, Bravo 7. That's what I'm doing with my fighters, I'm just gradually drifting them over onto the eastern side and then pulling them back towards the centre. Just to simply act as a potential warding unit, i.e. that we're trying to dissuade the enemy aircraft carrier from sending their bombers back over. But then what I'm realising is, what if our Bismarck and our turrets are leading the way in close range to one another, and our Cleveland just behind? If the enemy aircraft carrier goes for any of those ships, they're going to be losing considerable aircraft. So instead, I'm preparing for the worst case scenario, which is they now move their fighters back towards the centre and I decide to put my fighters in a position to continuously spot the enemy fleet, as we're doing right now, even though the cyclone's drawing in, but on top of that, be there to guard against the enemy fighters coming over, locking them up if needs be for a considerable time. I would expect the Independence's fighters to win that engagement. Our bombers are now taking off, and our next target of opportunity will either be the Nelson once more, or alternatively the Leon, who seems to be extending away from the majority of their fleet. And we're just waiting for things like this to happen, waiting for enemy ships to extend outside of the AA radii of friendlies. Because the Leon and the Nelson together can provide a decent AA screen, but when they're alone, they're going to have a bit of difficulty. And add to that what I'm looking for at this point, which is ships that have lost health, because this tells me a key factor. If an enemy ship has lost health, that generally means they've been bombarded with shells. And if they've been bombarded with shells, that means they've lost AA pieces, particularly high explosive shells going in time and time again. If they've got less AA pieces, they're more vulnerable to an attacking threat, and our dive bombers are sure to eliminate some AA pieces as well if we get some accurate manual drops in there. So we go in for the strike, and hopefully we can score some fires. 
Two fires set, we get a good number of hits for our dive bombers, and now we send in our torpedo bombers. And looking at the health of that Leon, if they do come out full broadside to our torpedo bombers, it means they're going to take at least five torpedoes, if not six, and that should be enough to be able to knock them out of the game. With our torpedo damage just being over eight and a half thousand per torpedo maximum. So we're coming in on their broadside, looking at the minimap, trying to judge it because the cyclone is now in full effect. We called it right on their broadside, and we gun with the manual drops. Six torpedo hits, one devastating strike, one enemy battleship out of the game. At this point, all of our bombers go back once again, making the most out of the strike package, and we can see we lost minimal aircraft because we've been picking on isolated ships with minimal AA threat, compared to what we could have gone for if we'd taken a similar approach to our opponent in their independence. Just giving you the comparison there. Using our fighters to clear off any catapult fighters that are remaining around, what's also important to note is I'm trying to, at this point, learn how to deal with the cyclone spotting distances. You'll note that typically friendly ships are going to spot the enemy team before I can see the enemy with my own planes, with us being able to see them approximately three or so kilometers, if not closer, practically right on top of the enemy ship's AA batteries. Now what I'm doing with my fighters at this point is I'm actually positioning them towards Ograss Bay because I can see on the minimap that the enemy Algerie is trying to contest Ograss Bay. And I'm also checking the health state of the enemy biome which very quickly is going to be revealed to be full HP, which means they've got maximum AA piece configuration. So I don't really want to attack that bind at the moment, instead I just want to get all my bombers reloaded and wait for the next opportunity. So I'm sending my fighters back towards our grass bay to potentially spot the torpedoes from the enemy Algerie, although our grass bay may be using the hydroacoustic search considerable as well, but we're always there as a little buffer for them. Because our fighters can sit there for a little bit and we can lose one or two, it's not too much of an issue, as it seems as though the enemy carrier is now out of the game. Or at least they haven't taken an interest in pushing into the centre, where their fighters still being based over our friendly Bismarck and our friendly Tirpitz. And they're sending in some more dive bombers as well. So we're just helping our grass bay out here, trying to warn them of the torpedoes when they appear early. And it appears our grass bay is doing a very good job of dodging the incoming fire. And with the enemy Bayern having taken a considerable number of hits, they've probably got less AA pieces now, and we can go in for another manual drop with our dive bombers. We score two fires, we do a good amount of damage, and now we send in our torpedo bombs to try and take them out of the game. As our torpedo bombs make their way in, unfortunately it's not going to be, because we're going to see that the enemy team continues to crumble at an accelerating rate, and that is going to bring the game to an end prematurely before we can get the final strike from the enemy battleship. Still, in bringing our torpedo bombers over, we would be repeating what we did with the enemy Leon, I striking it and going for maximal possible damage, because they're still burning, and that would try to get them out of the game as quickly as possible. But we're just going to let the game end at this point and wait the post game stats. Not a phenomenal game by any means, but one that I was quite proud of at the time, simply because I felt that I picked the right targets to attack over the course of the game. We can see our total damage output amounted to a HP tally of 103,240 HP, and we also picked up two standard achievements on the way. Devastating Strike, for destroying an enemy ship with a single artillery salvo, torpedo salvo, or aircraft by causing damage to over 50% of the destroyed ship's normal health pool, in this case the enemy Leon, and we also picked up the first blood achievement for being the first to destroy an enemy ship in battle, scored on the enemy Akatsuki. Coming on to the team scores, we can see that we topped our team in terms of base experience earned, picking up 1,687. Our role was less focused on dealing with the enemy aircraft carrier, who was rather adamant to focus down the eastern side of the map, and we can see, from the number of aircraft shot down, that our Bismarck, Tirpitz and Cleveland provided the anti-aircraft screen against the threat of the enemy independence. Instead, our focus was on supporting the push from the western side of the map, taking out the enemy destroyer in the first instance, giving free reign to our friendly Shiratsuyu and Grass Bay to push through the centre and therefore form a pincer movement against the enemy team, then coming in from the west and the rest of my teammates gradually coming down from the northeastern corner of the map. Coming on to our detailed report, we have one key item to note here, and that is the number of aircraft we lost, just shy 20% of our total hangar capacity. This serves to demonstrate how reserved we were in trying to lead our aircraft into anti-aircraft screens, particularly focusing on enemy ships that were isolated or were already wounded and therefore had less AA pieces available. 
In turn, if that game had come down to the wire and gone all the way to the maximum time limit of 20 minutes, we would have more planes available to help turn the tide over the course of the remaining stages of the map. But here it wasn't needed, simply because our team started to gradually roll up the enemy team as time pressed on. And finally, coming onto our credits and experience earned, we can see that after additions and deductions, we walked away with 245,212 silver credits and 3,873 commander experience. To conclude, hopefully today we've demonstrated that taking a more reserved approach in a plus two matchmaking scenario in an aircraft carrier can really help you as an aircraft carrier player get the most out of your planes. As rather than trying to attack with brute force the enemy ships and therefore subject your planes to superior AA defences, particularly if the plus two matchmaking ships cluster together, focusing on those ships which are isolated and vulnerable to your bombers is going to work a charm. Taking out the enemy destroyer for instance in today's gameplay, we then offered our services to take out any battleships that became isolated, and on top of that those which were wounded. I had taken multiple hits and therefore were devoid of AA pieces which they would have potentially craved in that situation. And in return if the game had gone down to the wire, we would have multiple planes left standing in reserve to be able to bring them out and help turn the tide of the match. It wasn't required, but we're ready and waiting to help tip the tide if needs be. With that I've been TX141. And if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future World of Warships videos on my channel. And as always, if you're looking to get into this game today, feel free to use the link in the description of this video. It's completely free to sign up, it's a fantastic game that I thoroughly enjoy, despite my frustrations as a new aircraft carrier captain, but I'm learning as I go along, and you'll learn very quickly the tales and the knowledge of the high seas. But until next time, as always, ladies and gentlemen, take care, and fair seas.